Hello, church. It's good to be here. You know, I, uh, I was excited when Todd asked me to preach a few uh, weeks ago, and, uh, and then I looked at the passage and saw that it was about a guy coming back to a place where he was from, and they mistreat him <laughs> for the second time. Like, this is not the first time they do this. And uh, so here we go. Please do not learn from those in the synagogue this morning, but yet let's learn from Jesus, all right? Sound good? Today we're going to look at a couple passages, three big passages this morning. One, Luke 4, uh, two, Mark 6, where we just read, and then 1 Corinthians 1 is where we'll end. Uh, this morning, uh, it is a great joy and privilege. I, I was texting Todd yesterday, uh, 15 years ago, uh, they hired me at Mill Creek. So today is 15 years in one day. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you all deserve a round of applause. You took quite the risk. I, I think all the elders who helped Todd make that decision are no longer elders. Uh, I don't know what that means, but here we are. Uh, it, is, it is a great joy uh, to be with you. The only reason we decided, one of the main reasons we decided to plant in Edinburgh is because we wanted to be a part of this network and this church and this vision for making disciples in this area. So uh, I'm glad that we're here. So let's look at this. Jesus is going back to his hometown. He's, he's kind of made camp in Capernaum, uh, which is on the Sea of Galilee. He's made camp there, and uh, he's starting to change away from Capernaum. He goes back to his hometown. He does not get the reception you would think he would get. Nazareth is, is this place of really no notoriety. Uh, it's a, a place in the middle of nowhere. It's 25 miles from Capernaum. Maybe, maybe 500 people live there. Uh, it, it didn't even have a Christian church until the 4th century. It was a place where uh, stonemasons typically lived. The word that they use for carpenter can be translated different ways, but uh, more than most were stonemasons because when Herod Antipas made a, a fortress at Sepphoris, which was just north of Nazareth, he would get these people from the hill country of Nazareth, a place out of nowhere, and that's what they would do. As a matter of fact, Nazareth is, is such a nowhere place. It's never mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, Jew, uh, Josephus, the most famous Jewish historian, it never mentions it. And the Jewish Talmud, which is what they used to understand uh, the, the Old Testament, their commentaries uh, never mentions it. It's a nowhere place on the road to nowhere full of nobodies, that produces the greatest somebody who ever lived. Jesus grew up here, but he had been rejected here before. Uh, in Luke chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, there's three places I would have you turn. I'll, we'll cover all these, but if you want to see big chunks today, Luke 4 is one of them. In Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 30, this is um, one of the first times. Some commentators believe this is the same and it's a parallel, but most commentators believe this was a previous visit to Mark 6. It says that he goes to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as was his custom, you'll see that in Jesus' life, his purpose, his ministry, his pathway was to be with God's people on the Lord's day. He stands up to read. He reads from the prophet Isaiah, and then he says this, now, what a bold statement, but he reads from Isaiah. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. He's crowned me. He's given me authority to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover of the sight of the blind. To set liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And this is what he says. So then he rolls the scroll up and he sits down and it says this, listen. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. In other words, he gets up, he reads, and says, this is about me. Then he sits down, and everyone goes, not a word. Just kind of awe, amazement, and wonder that he just said what he just said. And so no one's speaking, and then Jesus says, oh, by the way, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I wasn't joking. This really is about me. And it says, all spoke well of him, and they marveled at his words. But then they say, well, wait a second. Isn't this Joseph's son? And then 
they say, doubtless you will quote to me, physician, heal yourself. But we have heard from you, you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown. Because he had already started to do ministry and the miracles and signs and wonders at Capernaum. And they said, well, we'll do it here too. But he said, and this is the phrase in Mark 6 as well, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. And he goes on and he gives them a rebuke. And so he gives this teaching and they're in amazement and wonder. And then he says, listen, you're not really believing. You're not really hearing. You're not really following. And so it ends this passage in verse 28. It says, when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. Change of tone. Filled with wrath. They rise up. They drive him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill in which their town was built. Remember, uh, Nazareth is like this bowl of a town on top of a hill. They take him to the edge so that they could throw him down the cliff. Like this is not a homecoming that you see in the movies where the guy comes in gallantly on a horse and they, they get him off and they drive him on the shoulders. This is not the scene. They're taking him to throw him off. And I love this. It says, but passing through their midst, he went away. I don't know how he did it. If like all of a sudden he looked like Rob O'Connell and no one was going to mess with him or, or, or what the deal was, but he just passed through their midst. Today in Mark 6, I want to point out three realities. Some good, some bad that this passage teaches. And the first one is uh, the two words, stay committed. Stay committed. That's a reality you see in this passage. In Mark 6, you see that the disciples follow him. The disciples follow him. When you look at this passage that Vitaly just read for us, he went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. Jesus is the great disciple maker. He's the one that we follow after. We love God. We love others. We make disciples. That's our vision statement. But all that is in relation to how Jesus showed us how to love God, how Jesus showed us how to love others, and how Jesus modeled how to make disciples. He's the great disciple maker, and he's teaching the disciples a lesson in bringing them with him. The, the disciples are about to learn a lesson, but that lesson is in how to deal with rejection. How to deal with rejection. That's what he's teaching them in this moment. In Mark 1.17, Jesus calls his disciples, if you remember back from that passage a few weeks ago, months ago now, and Jesus said to them, follow me. And I will make you become fishers of men. The simple call of Jesus to his disciples is two words. Follow me. It's not take a class. It's not go to a service. It's not read these books. It's not recite these prayers. It's not uh, get baptized three times facing west on the seventh Sunday with your belly button sticking out. That, that, there, that's not what happens here. What he says is, Follow me. The life of a disciple is summed up in those two words. Follow me. That's their initial call, and that's the call uh, that has become their way of life now. And so they follow him. It's a word that means uh, to come here and follow. They had to leave something. Do you remember when they were initially called? Uh, they, they are leaving what they're doing, and then he calls them a second time, and, and when they're, they're back and they're fishing. So they've given up following Jesus for a season. And now they're fishing and he calls them again. And they leave their nets. They leave their boats, it says. It's a call to, to leave something where you are located to go to where Jesus is. And that's what marks our lives as followers of Christ. It's the leaving of something daily. Our thoughts, our actions, our locations and joining him in where he is going. Jesus says it different when he says the life of a follower of Christ is one that, that takes up their cross daily. We daily die to where we are and go to where he is. Uh, Matthew 16, 24, he says it, If anyone would come after me, follow me, go where he is. Let him do this, deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The life of a follower of Christ is the person who leaves where they are and goes to where he is. How would you rank your commitment level to Christ today? That's what you see the disciples do, right? The reality here is they are staying committed to Jesus. I mean, we know his commitment level never ceases. It says that he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. He's always with us. It says in the Great Commission that he's with us 
always? How would you rank your commitment level to Jesus this morning? Or what might God be calling you to leave in order to, to go where he is? The disciples are committed to this calling. Their calling is those two words, follow Jesus. He enters Nazareth with disciples who are following him. However, he's greeted by people who did not have the same belief in their hearts, right? This is the second reality. That some people stay away from Jesus. That's the second point. They stay away. That's the second reality that you see when people are, are, are faced with Jesus. Some are going to stay committed. Some are going to stay away. Jesus' custom was to, to go and be with God's people on the Sabbath. It says it in Mark 21. It says it in the passage we read in Luke, in Luke 4.16. Regularly, when Jesus goes to a town, he enters the synagogue. He goes to where God's people are before he does anything else. Jesus has people who don't want to follow him, even in the places you think they would, though, right? Like, sometimes you just think that they'll follow, they'll respond, they'll believe. They loved his works. They loved uh, the, his works just like the crowds did, right? There's crowds everywhere he goes. But when he began to teach truth, all things go awry. Things start to get uh, ruffled. They don't exactly like what they're hearing. They liked what they saw a little better. They saw the benefits of Jesus' mighty works, but they did not want to deal with the, the ramifications of their teaching in their lives. But isn't that the way it is? Right, like you can tell someone a hard truth and that's usually like the first step for them to no longer be around. People love our service projects, right? People, people love that. You go do something in the community, people will love it. You just did stuff for the, at Mill Creek, you just did something at Grover Cleveland, you beautified the outside. Uh, people love it. We're doing a mission trip in Edinburgh, bringing people in and, and doing work projects all over the town. People are going to love it. They love when you feed the hungry. They love when you clothe the poor or you house the homeless. Where you start to see the heart, though, is when you start to speak God's word. Rejection doesn't happen when they're getting miracles and signs and wonders, right? Like, no blind man is healed, and then says, Jesus, get out of here. It doesn't happen. We just read in, in, in Mark chapter uh, 4, Jesus heals a man, or sorry, Mark chapter 5, Jesus heals a man who is possessed by a demon. What does that man do? He says, I want to go with you. He doesn't say, getting out of here. Like, that was crazy. I don't want anything to do with you. Jesus regularly has to tell people, no, you, you can't come with me. That's the way people are. One author says that unbelief has four elements. It, it obscures the obvious. It, it elevates the irrelevant. It assaults the messenger, and it spurns the supernatural. That's what you see in this passage. On your, on your worship guide, you'll see these steps of unbelief in the religious in this passage. And these are not just things that we can like poo-poo the people of Nazareth about, right? These are things that we, if not careful, will do ourselves. And what we must fight against in our lives. The first one is we have this proximity that exists. We live in proximity. Right now, you're living in proximity because you're at a church service. But proximity doesn't mean anything. Anybody can come to a church service. Right? Like the, in Mark chapter 1, the first time you see Jesus heal a man with an, a, de a demon, where does that happen? At a church service. Proximity means very little. They're at the synagogue. That, that's their custom, the Jewish people there. Uh, they're in proximity to the Savior of the world. Remember, faith in Jesus, not proximity to Jesus, is proof of your relationship with Jesus. That's a tweet. If you missed it, I'll help you again. I see like the, the seven, the seven uh, 25 year olds are right here, so I'll say it so you guys can hear. Uh, you ready? Good? 
Faith in Jesus, not proximity to Jesus, is proof of your relationship with Jesus. Don't be just content to, to follow him at a distance. Jesus has followed him. It takes steps of faith. Make bold risks for his name. And we tend to undervalue that which we are familiar, right? Like how many of you thought of how thankful you are for the milk that you put in your cereal this morning? If you're lactose intolerant, don't tell us. We know. You probably told us three times already this morning. We get that. But, I mean, think about that. Like, we just, little things, we just let them go by the wayside. I I just don't, I don't think of that. When I pour my almond milk into my Cheerios, I don't think, man, I'm so glad that these almonds can be milked. (laughs) I don't know how they do it still, but I'm, I don't think about how grateful I am. I'm familiar with it. It's comfortable. And so I just utilize it. Familiarity, it just breeds contempt, doesn't it? You get so used to it. You see it in your families, right? Like you're, you're super nice to your neighbors, and then you go inside, and then you let the real uh, creature come out. So there's, there's this element that exists in, in the first step of unbelief, which is proximity. We're close, but, but there's not much... That goes with it. Second is you see the people are astonished. In verse 2, in Mark 6, it says, On the Sabbath he began to teach. He's in the synagogue with them. Many who heard him are astonished, it says. It means to be stricken with amazement. It, it literally could be translated, he blew their minds. That's what it means. It means to strike something with an intensity that there's change. It, it, he blows their minds with what he says. And that was normal, right? In Mark 1.22, it says they're astonished at his teaching because he taught with one who had authority. Five verses later, it says they're all amazed, same word, that they question among themselves saying, what is this? It's a new teaching. They're hearing his teaching. They're amazed. They're astonished. In Mark 2, you see the man who is, who's lowered through the roof, right? The, the paralytic. And they heal him. And they are all amazed, questioning among themselves, saying, what is this, a new teaching? Sorry, that was Mark 127. In Mark 2, it says, he rose, he picks up his bed, the man picks up his bed, and it says that everyone is there as they're amazed and they're glorifying God. It's saying, we've never, we've never seen anything like this. In Mark 5, where we just were, the man who, who has the demon, and he, they send the demons into the pigs, and the man says, I want to go with you, Jesus. And Jesus says, no, you can't go with me. You've got to stay here. The first man to take the gospel message to the Gentiles was a man who had a demon, and was sent into, that demon was sent into pigs. And so then this is what it says about him. This is the passage that marks his life, by the way, not that he was a man with demons who couldn't be ch- controlled, and he was chained up, and he, he hurt people, and he, he wounded, and he said bad things. What marked his life was, he went away, it says Mark 5.20. He went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus, how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. And so in the, in the Gospel of Mark, you see this, they're amazed at his teaching, at his teaching, at his healing, and now what's amazing in 520, they're amazed at this life change through Christ. But we can be astonished and yet not believe, right? I mean, the people in Mark 1 didn't believe. 127 probably didn't believe. Mark 2, maybe not believe. I mean, we we have no proof of amazement or astonishment that equals belief. Third, you have questioning. They start to say things like, well, wait a second. We've seen this guy before, isn't isn't this the carpenter? The the, the word carpenter is tecton. It it could mean a a myriad of things. It can mean even up to physician. But isn't this the carpenter, the woodworker, the stonemason? Isn't Isn't that who this is? It's almost like they stop and they pause and they say, now wait a second. And so proximity has, we're used to him now. He's been here. We remember him. Um... It's amazing what he did, but wait a second. Isn't he? And they start to question. Fourth is doubting. It's almost like they said, now wait a second. And now they're saying even further from belief. And they're saying, this can't be. Now now this can't be. Because they say, where'd this man get these things? What's this wisdom? How is such mighty works 
done by, done by his hands. The emphasis there, by the way, is not on his hands, it's on his. And so we don't read it, how, uh, how are such mighty works done by his hands? We read it, how are such mighty works done by his hands? Do you catch that? Say, I caught it. You don't have, you're not like in sun uh, comas yet. Is not this the carpenter, the, the son of Mary? And we may read over that, and we may not think much of it. But when he says that, when the crowds say that, is this not the son of Mary? They're insulting him. They're pointing out, wait a second, that's the kid. That's the kid whose who's dad is God. That's Mary's son. Not Joseph's son. Did you catch that? They're pointing out the fact that he's probably an illegitimate child. They're degrading him. They're putting him down. They start to doubt him. And then it leads to offense, the fifth one. People get offended. So they're close in proximity. Then they get astonished. There's some wonder, amazement. They okay, we kind of like this. And then, wait a second, they start to question. And then they start to doubt this can't be. And then they get offended. It's almost like they say, it isn't. They've said, this can't be. Now they're saying, it isn't. If you look in verse 3 in Mark 6, it says that he's the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, Simon, are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. It's interesting that after this, every time the synagogue is mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, it's either dealing with hypocrisy or persecution. In Mark 12, it talks about how the Pharisees and the Sadducees would have the best seats in the synagogue and, and the place of honor at feasts. He was talking about their hypocrisy of these religious leaders. And then in Mark 13, he says, be on your guard. He's warning his disciples that he loved. He says, be on your guard. They're going to deliver you over to councils. You will be beaten in synagogues. No longer is it a place to come and talk and have good friendship about Jesus about God, it is now a place where you may be beaten. It says they take offense at him. Matthew 11 says, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Who is not offended by me. Mark says these people take offense. It comes from the word scandal on meaning a stumbling block. 1 Corinthians 1 says that Paul writes to the church at Corinth and he's explaining the gospel and he's setting some groundwork for, for how to live out their faith. He says, we preach Christ crucified. He's a stumbling block to the Jews and it's folly to the Gentiles. Jesus has called us to follow him. Oh, we must fight against satisfaction with proximity or just being customs, you know, like we come to church, we go to C group, we go to D group, we go to this study, we go to that study, we do this, we do that. We can't just be satisfied with being astonished. We surely can't dwell in questions of doubt. One commentator says, exposure to Jesus and the gospel is no guarantee of faith just because you're exposed to it. Well, that is the first step. We have to hear the gospel to, to believe it. Exposure to it is no guarantee of faith. He continues, he says, Indeed, apart from faith, exposure to the gospel inoculates as often as it enlivens. In other words, some people are going to hear the good news of Jesus and it's going to do nothing for them. And some people are going to hear the good news of Jesus and they're going to repent of sin and they're going to follow him. They're going to believe. I mean, look at who's against him. The religious at the synagogue. The people that you would think would be on his side. It's those in his hometown, it says. It's his relatives. It's his own household. John 7, 5 says, Not even his brothers believed in him. By the way, James, his one brother, would later become the author of the book of James. He'd become the, the pastor of the biggest church in the world at the time and then would be thrown off the temple in AD 62 by order of the Jewish high priest. So not only would his brother James go from 
unbelieving person who has said he's out of his mind to being a person who would call himself a slave of his brother in his opening in James chapter 1. A servant of his brother. Calls him his Lord, his master's ruler. Judas, his brother, would later become the author of Jude. So these men, eventually, there's transformation that happens. It doesn't surprise Jesus, by the way. Like when they get upset and get mad, like he gets it. In Mark 3.21, it says that his family comes and they say, "Don't, don't pay attention to him, he's out of his mind. Has your family ever said, he's out of his mind, or she's out of his mind? You go to live for Christ, and you make decisions, and you make calls, and you make encouragements, and they say, he's, he's crazy. Just, just let, him, let him have his five minutes. Let him go through his spiel. Then we'll eat the mashed potatoes. Like, just let him get it out of his system. You think Jesus doesn't get that struggle? When your heart hurts for those that you love, in your family, and you want them to know the greatest joy can be found in Christ, and you, and you share that with them, and they just deny you. They deny your Savior. Jesus gets it. Knowledge of opposition, though, it leads to confidence in the situation. That's what you see here. Jesus, he, he, he knows that this is going to happen. It's not a surprise to him. Like, he doesn't go to Nazareth and go, oh my gosh, I cannot believe they treated me this way. Sticks up his nose at him. That's not what happens. It's very opposite of Mark 9, when the man has a young boy and he's healed of an unclean spirit. And the father comes and Jesus says to them, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Belief is a huge part of this passage. In verse 24, it says, Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Say that real quick. Say, I believe. believe. Help my unbelief. You didn't say that one as much. Did you notice that? I believe. Yeah, we're all about that. Help my unbelief. That's, that's, That's all of our problems. That's my problem. I'm fearful or timid or slow to seek him out and to say, help my unbelief. This ought to be our prayer. It's, it's, it ought to be my prayer. I'm convinced that we don't have a mental belief problem. <laughs> like we, we, we up here in our heads, like, yeah, we believe. It's the issue of do we have a heart belief, a heart faith. Unbelief really is that the root of all sin. It's what Eve struggled with in the garden, right? It's what we struggle with when we don't follow Jesus. And think of how unbelief has played out just if you look at Scripture. Now, we could do this in a million different ways because everyone has had unbelief in their life in a million different ways. But just through Scripture, Eve did not believe what God had said, right? That's the initial temptation. Did God really say she doesn't believe? Sin enters the world. When Noah is alive, why does God destroy the earth? Because of their unbelief, the way that they lived. Israel's unbelief, they wander through the promised land for 40 years. Aaron doesn't believe, 3,000 are slaughtered. Moses doesn't believe. In that instance, he doesn't enter the promised land. Judas, of course, doesn't believe and it ends in his suicide. In our unbelief, it says that we end up with eternal punishment, hell. We perish without God. John's Gospel is probably the most clear on the theme of belief. It says that in John 20, 30, and 31, that Jesus did many signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written, what is included in the Gospel of John, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. But in Mark 4-6, through He gives a pretty good runners-up summary. I mean, if you think of it, if you just look in your Bibles at Mark 4-6, through and you think of how often 
you see belief come into play. When he talks about the parable of the sowers, it's all about the varying degrees of belief. When you talk about the lamp under a basket, it's all about are you going to let your belief be demonstrated for others? The seed growing, it's all about how your belief, how your trust increases. The parable of the mustard seed, how great your small amount of belief can produce. When Jesus calms a storm, what's he say to them? Do you still have no faith? It's all about their belief. In John cha- or Mark chapter 5, he heals a man with a demon. It's all about the belief of the power of Christ over all these circumstances. And then last week, what a powerful picture. Jairus says, I believe. And then on the way to go heal his daughter, who's sick, he heals a woman who believes to the point of sacrificing uh, her, herself uh, socially and goes to Jesus. She has great belief. And then... The daughter dies. And Jesus' response is, do not fear, only believe. Do not fear, only believe. Mark gives a pretty good summary of belief being very important in our lives here. And in Mark 6, 1 through 6, what you see is that these people just aren't believing. The way Jesus is treated, by the way, should not cause us to feel bad for him or feel sorry, like he's some kind of weak and some just just wimpy Jesus, this groveling king who, who needs people's acclaim or praise. It should remind us that the all-powerful king is an example of someone who stays true, even when those who would seemingly be the most obvious believers disagree. When your family, when your kids, when your parents, those in your community group or your discipleship group, they start to have doubts and they start to have fears and they don't believe, take heart. For Jesus knows that pain. And then it says something real interesting. It says in Mark 6, 5, he could do no mighty work there. Well, how does that work? It's not a power problem. It's a purpose problem, right? The purpose of miracles is to to attest to the truth of the gospel, attest to the truth of the miracle worker, attest to the truth of the message of those doing the miracle. The people had rejected the truth, so there's no need for the miracles, no need for attesting. Matthew 7, 6, it says, Do not give to dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you, which is, by the way, what they did to Jesus. So it's not a power problem, it's a purpose problem. He no longer has a need or a purpose to do it. And Paul does the same thing in Acts 19.9. It says, when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, they spoke evil of the way before the church, the congregation. He withdrew from there and took his disciples with him. So when this happens in our life, because it will, if you live for Christ, it will happen. People will deny you. You will not get this great rejoicing welcome. People will reject you and your message. How do we respond? What's our action step? You know, it's in these moments we must surely model Jesus. Jesus is about staying true to His calling even when it's tough. Staying true even when it's tough. And that's the third reality. Some people stayed committed, the disciples. Some people stayed away. But Jesus stayed true. All the people are astonished at Jesus for this seemingly unable, unequipped, illegitimate child of a nobody. But Jesus is amazed at their lack of unbelief. I mean, think about that. Nazareth, of all places, should have been the place where they believed. I mean, they saw him grow up. Like, they know he's a nobody, and now they're hearing what he's doing, and they're hearing him teach. They, of all people, should have the greatest of belief because they have the evidence that goes with the faith. But they don't. See, we can stay true because we're in the truth. Those that do not believe are not in the truth. It should amaze us that with all the evidence, all the opportunity that people don't believe, that's what should amaze you That's what amazed Jesus. Like, I cannot believe they don't believe this. I mean, can you imagine that? Like, he's healing all over. It's almost as if Jesus does this, and then they get mad at him. He goes, huh? You, wait a second. So you're you're telling me 
You don't believe? That don't make sense. So we can stay true. It should amaze us. When you, uh, when you share the gospel and someone doesn't believe, sometimes you get amazed and it's an, in a negative way. But what you ought to be amazed at is that they don't, it, it amazes me that you don't believe this. Like that's, that's kind of crazy. With all the evidence that sits before you and you, you don't believe? Jesus is only amazed, by the way, at people once in the Gospel of Mark. And it's at their unbelief. He's never amazed at their, their wonders or their accomplishments. What amazes him, what shocks him, what causes him to go, huh, is their unbelief. But Jesus knew this would be his life. Isaiah 53 it says that he was dis- it said that the Savior would be despised and rejected by men despised, rejected. It didn't shock Jesus. It wasn't like, oh my. He didn't journal and write a letter. You guys are not going to believe what they did to me today. How dare they? Let's start a movement. Let's wear t-shirts. Let's get wristbands. Let's make hashtags. That's not what he does. The That didn't shock him. But yet he stayed true. He continued on with his calling. We ought not be surprised when we're persecuted, when we're put down, when we're marginalized for our faith. Jesus said you would. John 15, 20. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted Jesus, and by the way they did, they will also persecute you. Hans Beyer says it this way, we follow a crucified Savior, or sorry, we who follow a crucified Savior should not be surprised by the cruciform life that is thrust upon us as we seek to be faithful to Him. Those of us who follow the crucified Savior should not be surprised when, when the cruciform life is thrust upon us for having belief in Him. If you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to one more place. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 1. I want you to see this. I love this passage of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 1. So you got your phone, you got your Bible, turn there. This is participatory. God is watching. And Dave. That's, I think that's why he's up there, by the way. Um, it's making me a little nervous. <laughs> not going to lie. 1 Corinthians 1. 18 through 31. So it's a long passage. We're not going to hit every word, but just just follow along here. Paul's writing about the gospel. And he says, The word of the cross is folly, foolishness, to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's good news for us, right? The gospel is the power in our lives. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. And then he asks these questions, and they're, 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 they're not meant to be answered. Where's the one who's wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made the foolish of the wisdom, or has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world didn't know God through wisdom. In other words, they had all the wisdom that they, you would think they would need, and they couldn't figure out who God was. It pleased God that through the foolishness of what we preach, to save those of, what, of those who believe. The Jews were demanding signs and Greeks were seeking wisdom. But followers of Christ, church, we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block, a scandal on. Something people take offense to. He says in verse 26, he's writing to the church at first at, at Corinth and he's saying, hey, this is what's going to happen. People are going to be against you. They're going to think it's foolish. They're, they're going to think you're not wise. They're going to think you're no good. They're going to have all these issues with you. And so Paul's solution to that problem and our solution to this problem when it happens in our life is verse 26. Consider your calling. Consider your calling. Not many of you were wise. I mean, I know most of you. Pretty true statement. 
Just kidding. Like, we know each other. Like, none of us have PhDs and things like that. And like, there, there's not many of you out there that have a wall of degrees. So by default, by the worldly standards, we are no longer considered wise. Not many of us were considered wise. Not many were powerful. Not many of you were noble birth. I mean, not many of you have millions and billions of dollars in palaces. And if you do, we are accepting donations at Edinburgh Community Church for a building. Just if you do and you've just been waiting to do something with it, it's right here. There's a box down there. Don't go to the one on the tree. If it's got six zeros, there's the other one. No, that's not us. That's not who his audience was. God chose what's foolish in the world to shame the wise, what's weak in the world to shame the strong, what's low and despised, the things that are not, so that no one could boast. See, in the middle of this issue of people going against the people of God, Paul says, brothers, sisters, that's going to happen. It's going to be normal. But consider your calling. Do you remember what your calling is? We said it at the very beginning. Two words. Someone yell it out. Follow me. That's your calling. Jesus knew that. He stays true to his calling about preaching, by the way. In Mark 1.38, it says, uh, Peter comes and interrupts Jesus when he's praying. And he says, well, we've got to go into the next town so that I can preach there. For that's why I came out. Matthew 9.35, it says, Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues. Matthew 11.1, 1, Jesus had finished teaching his disciples. He goes on to there to teach and preach in those cities. In Luke 8, it says, afterward, he went through the cities and villages. He proclaimed and brought the good news. In Luke 13, 22, it says, he went on through towns and villages, teaching. That's what Jesus came out to do. But then it says this, and don't miss this. It says, and journeying toward Jerusalem. Now, in that moment... As they were going to Jerusalem, they didn't get it. But we look back with 2,000-year-old eyes and can go, well, when he journeyed toward Jerusalem, what happens in Jerusalem? He's arrested. He's beaten. He's flogged. He's mistreated. He's spit upon. They rip his hair out of his beard. He's crucified. Jesus stayed true to His calling even to the point of the cross. So I want to ask you today as we wind down, do you, do you believe? And I don't mean like you, you came and you believe like, yeah, I believe. But do you have a belief that's led to action lately? Like do you have a belief that has led you to tell someone about what you believe? Do you have a belief that's led you to, to live differently, to make sacrifices, to take risks for the name of Christ? Do you have a belief that has made you look different in the world? Do you have a belief that's made you have a conversation with someone you love and share the good news of the gospel? That God had a, a perfect world created, but through the fall and the rebellion of man, we fell away from that perfection. We fell away from that peace. We fell away from that harmony. And we needed a rescue. And that rescue was found in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And now we can live a new life with Him. And He restores you daily. And one day He'll fully restore you. John 3 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. And whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The wrath of God does not remain on sin in your life. The wrath of God remains on you. Don't miss that. It's not about the sin that you commit. It's about you. God's wrath remains on people, not their actions. Whoever believes has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. 
That saying that we used to use, well, hate the sin, love the sinner. That might work for you, but that's not how it works for God. God hates both. He says His wrath rests on Him. But there is good news. And there is a way out of that wrath. Because all of us are born into that wrath. All of us are born opposed God. All of us are born not wanting to follow after Him. We have to have a new life. We have to be born again, it says in John 3. And in John 3.16, after Jesus has told Nicodemus, you must be born again, He says, God so loved the world. God loved the world. That He gave His only Son. Not just some guy. His only Son. God disrupted the beauty of the Trinity and the community and the fellowship and the harmony that existed in heaven for all time because He loved you. Your role is not to be like the people of Nazareth, but your role is to believe. And if you believe, it says in John 3.16, you won't perish. (laughs) You won't go away. This life will be temporary, but you'll never taste the sting of death. But you'll have eternal life. Don't fall to pray. Don't fall prey to the unbelief like the people of Nazareth. Trust in the works of Jesus. Trust in the Word of Christ. Believe in Him. Receive Him. If you do not know Him, I pray that today is that day that you would, you would say, you know what? Mentally, I have thought through this and I have kind of believed, but I haven't made any changes in my life. I've not had any true following Him. I I might have believed, but I've never followed. I want to give in to that calling on my life. I want to follow Him today. Believe in Him. Receive eternal life. Uh, Grow in eternal life. Tell others about that joy that's found in Him. Let's be people that, that truly have loved Him and love others and are aiming to make disciples in all our areas of life. Let's pray. Father, we want to be people who, like the disciples, are committed to our Savior. We want to be people that in the face of of rejection or, or, or people putting us down, we stay true to you and to your word. We want to be people that no matter the risk, we honor Christ. We want to be people that, who greatly enjoy you, who have understood the gospel, who have lived it out, who not only have eternal life as a quantity of life, but we live as people who have eternal life as a quality. That we take great joy in knowing that you have given us life and life to the full. God, make that happen. Change our hearts. Change my heart to, to greater value you today. Cause me to to increase my commitment to you, to decrease my commitment to self, and to be a person who truly follows you in all areas of my life with great belief. God, I ask this for myself and for all God's people. Amen.